This video is my standard intro to the world of watercolour painting and is applicable to every subject. I will explain to you how I set up my space and lay out my materials ready at hand and easy to use. This includes the layout of my paint colours and I will demonstrate the specific ways I utilise each part of the palette itself for effective painting results. There will be information about brushes, how they differ and why I choose what I use for watercolour painting with some mini demos to show how I handle them in various ways to create a diversity of mark. I will give my choices for a standard palette of colours which are also suitable for beginners. With the hundreds of paint colours, brands and qualities available, it will be hard to know how, where to start. Often less colours and more know-how on how, what they do is better than many colours and little understanding of how they work in the painting process. Less is more. Ten colours to start with is plenty. A warm and cool of each of the primaries, two to three earth colours and a dark are just about right. I will attempt to demystify a few of the characteristics and the terminology of paint that are useful to know, hopefully without overwhelming you. So let's begin. Okay, so I'm Rosalind Hartwig and welcome to my classroom, my watercolour classroom. And I am, we're doing trees in the landscape uh, for eight weeks. So tonight it's all about shape because trees are defined by what their shape is. Before I even start doing the things with the trees, I'm just going to talk about how I work with my setup, how I uh, work with my palette in particular. So this is the way I've been working for over 20 years. I have been an artist for over, long, over 20 years. I've been teaching for... Uh, close to 13 now. So so I have my board. Often I, I have it um, sitting up on this. The reason I use this is because it is because I stand when I paint. With um, a classroom situation I often have it on a board on a lean so that my um, so that you can all see what I'm doing. And it might surprise a few people but I do actually paint upside down for your benefit, not for mine, um, but that's fine. Then I also have two water pots. One is officially for the dirty water and the other one for clean water so that when you need to put some water on your paper, um, you can do that. Palette uh, there, as always, it's spotlessly clean. Um, this is the way my palette looks most of the time. But there is a reason for it, which will be explained at a later date, we we'll just shortly. I use two towels, or at least a towel um, here to have my brushes on. And because you do not keep your brushes in your water, um, so as soon as you wash them out, you just put them on the towel. The other thing that's good for is to get off excess water. You can just dip it there and use it that way. Tissues, love tissues, um, but there is times and places for them. They're not to be used all the time. And I have extra paint, which I haven't put out in my palette. Um, it's always a good idea to um, top up your palette um, as, as you need. Usually I'm happy with what I've got in my palette. Uh, the first time um, towards, just in the first, uh, just to wet your palette up so that it's um, the water becomes watercolor becomes useful. Okay, I do have very specific ways of working with my palette. One of those is that I have the paint in the top corner. I'm right-handed, so this is the way I work with my palette on this side, with my brushes on that side, my board on that side. Uh, there is, if you're left-handed. Flip it over. That way it'll be fine. Um, I put a decent dollop of paint on my thanks, Doug. Appreciate that. 
I uh, put a decent dollop of paint into the top corner of my wells. I use a deep well palette. This one is probably the largest that's available that I know of. And I find it just very useful. I've been using the same sort of palette for as long as I've been painting, pretty much. I can see that. Yeah, this is my second. I wore the first one out. <laughs> um, and so when I when I work with my palette, um, I then uh, wash it in so that there's a nice washy, soupy sort of area here. So that's ready to use paint. It actually just looks like that. And well, actually even just that. This one's indigo. So I have my main palette uh, paint blob here and the water is here and that way it doesn't um, combine with each other and it actually works really well. Most of the time I'll have my palette on a slight lean, only about that much, not, not as I'm holding it at the moment. Uh, yep, got a question Doug? Yeah, I have. So you've got side by side the same colours. That's your, that's your main paint and that's the one where you work it with water, is that right? No, no, I've got different colour paint in each of these wells. But I work with this in that area here. Oh. So that I've got a blob of paint there. In the corner. In the corner. Okay. And that way this is actually the ready to use paint and generally. And you use this part of it to mix it. I don't always mix that part, use that part. What I then, um, so what I end up with is one area that's got paint that is ready to use. Nice and thick and strong. It's easy to water that down just by dipping your brush part way into your palette and all, I'm um, sorry, into your water bottle. And you have water that's halfway usable. Then if you want really strong paint, you get it from the, the area of pigment and you end up with something that you can use for dry brush. Um, ultimately then, if I really want something quite light, all I need to do is use it, what I have on the side here and again I end up with um, light coloured paint here. So there's three main differences of paint tone value already on my palette. When I set my palette up, I tend to work with yellows going through to reds, um, violets into greens going from light blues up to dark blues. Now these, that's um, again the same way I've had this for ages and across the top I use my earth colours. Now the main earth colours I have are raw umber, burnt sienna and burnt umber. Raw umber and burnt umber sometimes can look like the same thing in the tube or when they're sitting in the palette. So one of the ways that I work that I keep it separate is that the raw umber is sort of like a dirty yellow. Um, often. It's not a really clear bright yellow uh, and the burnt umber on the, by contrast is actually a brown, quite different. And so I have the yellow, my raw umber next to my yellows. I have the um, burnt umber next to my darks. And so that's easier to work with how that, how that um, and then, of course, in the middle, I've got my earth red, which is burnt sienna, or something similar to that. Burnt sienna. That's burnt sienna. So I'll just quickly explain one more thing about my palette, and that is why I keep it dirty. It's quite simply because if you mix all of this together, you end up with a grey. Very easy. Greys are lovely to work with. If I wanted, that's more of a yellowish um, neutral grey. If I wanted to make it a bit more yellow, I just put a bit of extra yellow into it. Uh, and often I'll have a yellow orange so section here. I often have used this one as my violet and the bottom one as my green. So even here, if I wanted a green, grey green, there it is. If I, I've got this mostly as uh, a bit of everything at the moment. Look at that, I've got yellow on that. Never mind. If I wanted to make that into a violet, it really becomes quite simple. 
just by putting a little bit of pink or something. And so I've got my grey from Violet. And it's that simple to get your, your greys. So don't be one of the, don't, you don't have to clean your palette all the time and keep it spotlessly clean. It's very usable this way. But we'll get more into that later on. The other thing I want to talk about straight away is brushes. Uh, main brushes that we'll be using tonight are rounds. I have them in several different sizes. What are they called? They're called rounds. Rounds? Yep, they're just a round brush. Oh, and they're round, but they've got a point. Yep, yeah, and once, as soon as once you um, wet them, they should come to a nice point. Okay. Okay, if they don't, still you still can use them, but they're maybe just not as, as easy to use when you want something that's fine. Uh, these ones here are all Taclons, I'm uh, sorry, synthetics. Uh, they, there is the white ones that you have, um, which is totally stained now because I've just used it with white Taclon. Or sometimes you'll get a brownish um, colour, but it is also syn uh, still a synthetic. The natural hair brushes are the sables, and I actually don't have that either. That's the sable. Um, all of those are synthetics, actually. <laughs> this is my sable. And again, I think it's a little bit old and it's not going to come to a point properly. <laughs> yes, Sharon's got some really good brushes down the back there. Um, mine's a bit of a motley crew sometimes, I'm sorry. You just get good brushes. No, it's better. You would expect the two to have good brushes, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most of mine are at home, this is a problem. <laughs> um, the sables are different to synthetics because they're a softer brush. They'll give you a slightly different mark. If you want to be very specific about what, you, what you're doing, um, that's when you can um, uh, use a synthetic. If you're wanting to work with something a little bit more fluid, um, the sables are great for that. Either way, you can work with either type of brush. There's no problems with either. It, they just do something that's slightly different, but they'll both do the same, um, enough of a job. But if you've only got synthetics, fine. If you've only got sables, also fine. Uh, we'll work with both. The um, next one that's sort of like that, but much, much longer, is what's known as a rigger, a liner. Um, there's probably a dozen names for those. I think those are the main ones. And what they do is they're long and skinny and they just give you a nice mark. Um, there will be times when we'll use that and especially when we get into doing trees, we will be using this tonight if you have them. Um, because you can actually get some really nice interesting marks with these as well. So that's that one, and my other brush, a good one, is my um, squirrel mop. Now again, a mop is characterised by having the wire around the, the hair on the end. That, so most of the ones that you actually um, see like that, there's three different types. This one's a pure squirrel. Uh, we won't get into the ethics of any of that. Then we've got your synthetic, which is that type of one, and I haven't got it here, but there is another one that is somewhat similar, and it's a squirrel synth um, synthetic mix. Now, again, any of those will do, do a similar job. They put down a lot of water very quickly, and um, so you can actually put your paint in quite nicely just by putting in the extra water. Um, they also um, come to a good point. So even though it's a very wide brush, you should be able to get some very fine marks out of it as well. And often you'll find me using brushes on the end like this. I hold them literally at the end uh, because you do get a more random mark than what I would be able to get if I was holding like a pencil hold. 
So a pencil hold is one that, that is like this. If you want to get a very specific mark, you would probably use a pencil hole, but more so with a, a round, I'd say, than a mop. You're not likely to use the mop as a pencil hold. Um, so a pencil hold is really just being able to work very carefully into what it is you want to do. The other way I hold my brush is, in this way we'll, we'll certainly be working with this tonight, and that's with my hand over top. Now the reason we do that, and um, the other thing I'll have to talk about is paper, is because you can get some random marks. You've still got a fair bit of control, but at the same time um, you, you can skim the paper. We're working on rough paper tonight, and that's because with the subject of trees, often will and landscapes will end up using what's known as a dry brush technique, which is basically just skimming the surface of the paper to get a broken mark like that. And when I use my hand over my brush like that, I have, as I said, a fair bit of control, and it's about how much pressure I use when I don't use very much pressure, it's a very light mark. If I wanted to make it a bit more filled in, I'll actually use the tip of it a bit more and still have that element of um, dry brush or, or not, or broken marks. So that's one of my favourite ways of holding my brush. And of course, as I said, the other way is right at the end. And because when I want a less controlled mark, as you often would with grasses and mm -hmm. even with tree trunks and stuff like that. Uh, tree trunks, sorry, the, the little fiddly branches at the end, we'll be using that. Uh, quickly I'll just mention paper. There is many, many different brands out there. Um, there's different types. Watercolour paper is fairly specific in, in the way it works. Uh, there's three main types of paper, and by that I mean the smoothness of them. Uh, hot press is a very smooth paper, and it, um, it gives you a different result to what we would with, um, uh, with the ones that we're using, which is the rough literally so that I get lots of broken marks. Hot press, it's much harder to get those sort of marks. A cold press is the one in between. Now, if you actually think of these as being, oh, I don't know about the guys, maybe you don't do any ironing. I'm not sure. Yeah, um, you do? Bachelor ones. Oh, so there you go. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't iron it either. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so if you think about hot press being with a hot iron, you're going to get the best result, the smoothest result. If you think about a cold press being using like a cold iron, you might get some wrinkles out, but you're not going to get it all out. And rough is actually either take, just taken straight off the line and chucked in your cupboard. That's, that's how I work, so most of my clothes are rough. <laughs> um, and um, tissues we'll eventually get to as well. So I think that's all of the basics. Now, who has got their paints already set up in their palettes or who hasn't? I've got now, some. Some. Who hasn't got their paints set up in the palette? One, two, three, four, sort of? Okay. So what we might do, yeah, John? I'm not sure I have a quite a collection of paint. I went to a previous art group yep, yep, um, yep. and I had paint for that. Now uh, I've inherited a whole lot of other colours, paints, mm -hmm. but they're not, okay. they don't coincide with what your list okay. and I don't know whether I've tried right. to bring as That's close fine. as I can. Okay, so um, again I might just explain quickly, uh, my general palette of colours or what I recommend is that I recommend a warm and cool of all of the primaries. So even though that looks very green, and it is actually green, uh, it comes across as being a little bit like a lemon, or something as, as is known as a cool yellow. 
a warm yellow has a lot more orange in it and so it becomes that's um, the next one I use. I have on my palette um, a cool red Uh, sort of, almost a little bit. If I thought this through a little bit more, it would have actually been properly. I tend to um, work on the fly a fair bit, in case you haven't already noticed. Um, then there's a warm, warm red. Now the warm red is um, definitely more your fire engine red. Okay, and on my list is also a pink. A pink of some kind. Probably not so much that we'll be using that as much this term, but when we do florals, absolutely, you know, that's a really great colour. Uh, another one I use is a mid green, which is this one. Um, good old sap green works, works good well for that. And again, I would also have sometimes a dark green. Again, for these two, definitely for convenience. It's much easier to pick up a bit of dark green or light or mid green and work with it than it is to mix. Now, there's plenty of options for mixing as well. Don't worry, we'll also get into that. Um, that particular colour, I think, is Deep Sap Green, which is a Daniel Smith one. Most of the colours that I've worked with are Marmory Blue and Daniel Smith. One comes from Italy and the other second one comes from America. There's plenty of good brands out there, so I'm not particular if you've got different brands to that, that's fine. Just as long as they've got decent quality. Don't work with um, your really, really basic student quality paints. They're really not worth the effort. And so, uh, so when you're getting, if you've got, um, if you've paid $20 for a set of 24 colours, I think you can pretty much guarantee that they're not going to be the best quality. That's so usually the best way. What happens why, when you try? What distinguishes quality? Okay. Um, often they're, they're much more opaque. Now, most watercolours colorists enjoy the transparency, transparency of um, watercolour. And opaque colours tend to be a little bit harder to mix. They tend to go, there's the proverbial mud that um, you probably have heard about. With opaque colours, they're much easier to get that murkiness. They just are not clear and beautiful. Um, so I prefer not to have those, but I'm not against having student quality so long as it's reasonable. Um, but nothing to do with their longevity or... Uh, yes, they could be. Um, again, a decent quality student, um, a decent quality paint is always more light fast um, than student quality. Light. Student quality could um, change, could fade or change colour, um, and so you won't end up with the results over the over the long term either. Okay. I don't think I'm going to be worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, it's just one thing to, to be aware of. Okay. Oh, and look, you, you might want to pass them down to your grandchildren. Who knows? I'll make that decision. I don't, uh, I don't think I'm anywhere close. So. Okay. Um, okay. The blues, the blues I like um, are cerulean, which is a cool blue. Uh, cobalt, which is almost a mid-blue, but probably going a little bit to the warm. Uh, ultramarine is a perfect, perpetual favourite of most artists. And um, so it's a nice, strong, but clear blue. Um, and the other one I'm not so fussed on is any variety of what, we, what I call a phthalo blue which is this one. It's often fairly similar to a cobalt and sometimes it called, called phthalo blue. Thalo. But phthalo as in um, the protect the uh, phthalo cyanine. Phthalo. Phthalo. Yeah. Phthalo. Yeah, it is actually spelt, I think. P T H A L O. 
Yeah, A-L-O. No, that's actually not the right spelling. No. Um, it's P-T-P-T-H. Oh. I know. You've got a go. <laughs> yeah, I'll try not to spit at you, it's okay. Oh, okay. Well, no, we'll give you shit. <laughs> and uh, my other favourite um, is a Payne's Grey, or I always just call it a dark, um, because it actually gives me that instant hit of um, something, yeah, um, powerful, I suppose. That extra you call impact. that's grey. Yeah, now there's, there is plenty of other options. Um, if you go to a neutral tint, it's more grey than that. It's raw. The Payne's Grey I use, which is mostly the Mimery Blue, has a little bit of blue into it. And so I consider it a very dark blue. Um, indigo is, is actually the colour I've got tonight. And it's very similar, but just a little bit greener. And so this is why I wasn't too worried when I... Um, again, obviously didn't check my paints before I come along, um, but anyway, <laughs> we won't go into that. And then of course, um, earth colours, I only use three usually. One is my burnt umber. Um, you can get quite a deep, strong mark out of that one. And my burnt sienna, or something similar. There's plenty of options there. And lastly, my raw umber. A lot of people use um, that's uh, raw sienna. I think that may even be a little bit of raw sienna there. Raw sienna tends to be even um, a little bit uh, more yellow yeah. again. Yeah. There's plenty of other oh, colours. Doesn't the intensity of the colour depend on how much water you use? Absolutely. Usually? Yeah. So as soon as you start uh, washing these out, you will get quite a light colour. And you can do that with pretty much all of these. Okay, so all of that actually, so intensity is not necessarily um, to do with the paint themselves, it's also how you use it. Um, so, uh, cerulean, for instance, is great as a sky colour. Cobalt's pretty good as well. A lot of the time, you'll actually use a cobalt as well. And um, phthalo, even, if you use it soft enough, can also be used as a sky colour. But if you actually put that one down too strong, it becomes very intense and almost unnatural. And that's one of the reasons I don't like it um, as a general rule. Um, but a lot of people, I, I tend to work very in a very natural way. So I tend to like my greys and I tend not to want to have my colours be too bright and cheerful. Um, if you like that sort of thing and you let me know, I won't insist that you do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to sort of yeah. bounce all these questions. But no, that's, maybe, uh, that's fine. Uh, I'm sure you're not asking yeah, well, anything well, about anybody else. You call that a grey, yeah. very dark grey. It's a charcoal grey almost, isn't it? Um, but it's, I just call I mean, it very are, blue grey. How do you get a lighter grey? Yeah, um, one way is to use my palette colours. Hmm. So one way is just to use your palette colours. So yeah. use your colour. Um, so if I was just using a palette grey. When you say a palette grey. <laughs> <laughs> I've confused a few people like that. I literally mean using it off my palette. It's not a bottle, it's not a tube no, colour. It's a bit of by guess and by God, so we don't buy doing that. Um, it depends what you want to do with it, because we will, um, it's just one of those things that I really enjoy, um, is it's very easy to get a palette grey. It's, um, and one of the other ones I often will say, oh, it's also a palette green. And that can be just something green grey off my palette as well. Um, so, so over the next eight weeks, you'll get more used to this. Don't worry. Don't despair, Doug. It's okay. No, no. <laughs> I've got all Doesn't these tubes of paint from different grades and some of it might mark and some and, of it good stuff. Um, and this is why uh, I and, stick. And, and, mm. you know, the well, names the they call these things don't seem to have anything to do with, I mean, well, names I use it. Um, most of the names come from the actual pigments or the, or the 
um, the substance that they use it from in the first place. And so they are, there is these scientific names for a lot of them. I'm no expert on pigments. Um, I know what they do. I'm, I'm more into, uh, it, that's the colour I want, and so that's the colour I'll use, more so than knowing all the basic um, aspects of the scientific, technical aspects of chemistry. the chemistry. That's the word I'm after. Yeah. Um, so that's the way it is. Now, if we continue with doing any more of this, we'll never get to anything that looks like a tree. So what we might do at the moment is take a break. Uh, I'll go around, um, check out all of your palettes, and uh, hopefully we'll end up with a palette that has something similar to these colours on it, so that we're all more or less on the same page. I do try to keep the colour palette fairly fairly much like this all, all the time because that gives us our basics. Um, there is uh, so many colours out there and some of them are quite useful and they do different things but that's it for a whole different course. I actually do teach a colour course and it takes eight weeks to, to do so. So that just tells you a little bit about how much colour actually, have, um, how much is involved. So um, okay, I'm going to take a break and we'll well, check, check your palettes out. Okay? Cool. That's it for this introduction to watercolour painting. I trust that you will have grasped the importance of concise and well-placed setup for your materials that you will continue to keep while making adjustments as required for your own personal needs. The way I look at this is that watercolour is difficult and confusing enough when you get started. Why make it harder on yourself by not having the materials laid out in an easy to use mode? Please continue on to the next lesson where we will start the actual subject by looking at the shape of individual trees. Also comment below, sharing your own experiences with palette uses and painting layouts or ask questions where you are unsure of something. And join the private Facebook group Roslyn's Watercolour Classroom to connect with others who have joined and participate in these classes. I'll see you in the next video. Cheers for now, Roslyn. Learn and play your way to excellence in painting because perfection is not a possibility on this side of heaven.